So, hey guys, how's it going? Great. How are you? Good, good. Just been trying to catch up with WWDC. What's your general thoughts so far? It seems like this is about the biggest one we've had since they introduced Swift. There's just so much stuff. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, especially with the UI changes. So have you started investing money to buy a $1,000 stand? Yeah, I wish. Fortunately, at my company, we actually do video editing. We have editing bays, and we already have you know racks of Mac Pros. So I assume that those will get upgraded with the new machines at the fancy monitor, so I can go downstairs and, uh, and drool over them when I'm not actually you know just working over my MacBook. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about these devices. They're not for developers. Like, uh, they're for video editing, like massive 3D rendering, that kind of stuff, and big production companies. And maybe if you're doing like 3D games or something as a developer, I could see it being really worthwhile. But uh, business or enterprise type apps, it may be a little bit of an overkill, which is, <laughs> is definitely pretty <laughs> awesome. But day to day, maybe not so much. Yeah, exactly. So if people want to tweet at us, or we're also at Bright Digit on Twitter, at Bright Digit on Instagram and Facebook. Let us know your thoughts on WWDC and any thoughts you might have about all the new stuff that's coming out. out. Guys, so apparently you have a book coming out pretty soon. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. So go ahead and introduce yourselves and let me know a little bit about this book. So my name is Joshua Greet. I am a longtime author for RayWunderlich.com. I've done everything from creating tutorials to books to videos. This is a new project that we're putting together to teach test-driven development. It's called iOS Test-Driven Development by Tutorials. And I'm Michael Katz, and similar story. I've been with Ray Winderlich for a number of years and also done books, tutorials, spoken at the RW DevCon. Haven't done any uh, screencasts yet, but uh, maybe someday. And uh, yeah, both Josh and I are passionate about test-driven development. And we both came, I think, independently to the idea of writing a, a testing book. And uh, editor-in-chief put us together. And here we are, most of the way through it, just getting ready to, to finally finish it up. So test-driven development, I remember, I want to say it was like almost more than half a decade ago, probably almost 10 years ago. I went to a conference in Chicago, and I think it was Bob Martin who gave a talk on test-driven development. The idea being like, First, you write your test, and then you write your code. Is that kind of the gist of it? Or what are the components of test-driven ML? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, definitely. Writing tests first is, is definitely a big part of it. Keeping iterations small. I think test-driven development is all about you know, writing one small thing. You write a, a small test to implement something that you need to get implemented. You show the test actually doesn't pass. You implement whatever code is required to get it to pass, and then you verify it passes. And then you just repeat this process over and over so that when you finally you know, got your app out, not only have you got all the features written, you've got all of the tests that you're going to need alongside it. But it's not like you just write all the tests in advance. It's literally a small step by a small step is kind of what makes it different and special. It's a circle. You just go over and over again, add a little test, and you add some code to fix that test, and you test the next piece, and you add the code for that, and so on. So you're always in lockstep. So the problem I have had with test-driven development and iOS is some of the stuff that is pertaining to like the UI or perhaps like test-driven development. Sometimes you have different screen sizes, obviously. You might have to deal with something like core data or networking. How do you overcome those challenges when you're trying to do test-driven development? And the great thing about using TDD is that it really forces you to think about what your code is doing. And so if you want to make sure that your code is testable and you're starting out with no code, you're going to write your code in a way that is. So if you have a dependency on something external to the system, like a, a database or API or screen, you want to write your code you know, where you have a model for instance, and you test the model, so all the business logic and the data logic and so on, and then you can add the UI on top of that and then use a, a different type of testing like UI tests to handle making sure that the UI is correct, but that way you're certain that your business logic and state is consistent and complete before you even get there. And with TDD, even if you're following TDD from the get-go there, it's not to say that you have to test everything per se. For example, if you're going to be caught by another other way, like if the compiler is going to throw an error. If you actually hit an error while you're doing TDD, that counts as a failed test. With the UI portion, I typically look at it as if it's something I can configure in 
like interface builder. I don't, you know, not necessarily going to test that too heavy in terms of TDD because it's something I can see on screen. And Mike mentioned there's other tests that I can use if I really want to put tests in place for UI testing and so forth. TDD is really about, you know, structuring your code in such a way that it is testable, putting in, you know, protocols instead of talking directly to a database or like Mike says, you know, talking to models that are structured in such a way that you can actually put tests where you get the biggest bang for your buck as far as testing goes. So it sounds to me like we're talking here about kind of, this is similar exactly to what we talked about in our last episode when we talked about architecture and the fact that you need to architect your app around models. And it sounds like you're basically talking about like, especially when it comes to Swift, you know, doing protocol oriented programming and using mocks in your testing as opposed to directly connecting with things like user interface or your database or your network. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. In the book, I have a chapter where we're building out a, a fitness app. And instead of connecting to core emotion, we basically build a protocol around it so we can mock and stub data uh, and act as if you know these things were happening live, but they're actually just being faked by the tests. And that's the type of thing you would use for pretty much any kind of hardware or network or UI that you can do in your code. So we separate the logic and the pieces that are about the app that are unique from the things that are handled by the operating system. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's one of the things I really like about TDD is that not only is it a great way to make sure your code actually works in all cases, but it also encourages healthy architecture in the end because you're allowing for different things to be plugged in, like, oh, I need a fake core motion or health kit or core data or whatever. I can fake it in my tests so that way when I test the actual application, like you said, those are different tests. They're not TDD necessarily. Yeah, and it's particularly true when you're testing error conditions. So if you have logic in your code that handles detecting when a call is dropped and then when you reconnect to restart something, it is kind of hard to test, especially in a CI situation where you're building and testing your app on a server that's plugged into gigabit ethernet. So by using test-driven development, you've already separated out that networking layer so you can just supply errors and different combinations and ordering of conditions to test out that your app is going to handle those appropriately, even if they're very difficult to test manually. Even if you're starting from a point where, say, you don't have a completely new application, it's not to say that you can, you know, not introduce TDD later on. You know, a lot of these same principles of you want to talk through something else, even if you directly coupled yourself to talking to uh, networking calls or to core data or whatever, you know, external API it is, you're talking to that directly, you can break those dependencies and, you know, move your architecture in the right way even after the app has already, you know, launched or had a few versions out, we actually have some chapters in the book that go into details about taking a legacy-based app and moving it towards TDD. So I'd say that TDD is a great start if you're, you know, just kicking off an app. But even if you're not, you can still use and consider TDD just to, you know, ensure you're writing those tests first. And again, you know, just making sure that you've got the correct coverage and bang for the buck as far as testing goes. Yeah, you can start writing tests at any time in this way. So even if you have an app, and even if you have tests that you've written sort of after the fact to validate your behavior, when you write new code, you can start doing TDD at any point. So what are some challenges that people typically face when it comes to developing like an X code for iOS? That's different from, say, like your typical Vue.js developer or PHP or Python. Do you guys typically use the standard packages like the XC test stuff? that comes with Xcode and iOS, or do you use your own custom packages for mocking? Or what are some challenges that you've seen people face specifically in iOS? I think Xcode default XC test case is a little bit cumbersome. It's very much based on the old um, X unit or J unit type testing, which is, gosh, has to be 20 years old at this point. Yeah, I think it's, uh, or I don't know, whatever the 90s were. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. So uh, at my company, we actually use a form of what they call behavioral driven testing. So it's more descriptive. We use uh, frameworks called Quick and Nimble, which is a layer on top of XC test. So you still run the test in Xcode and you get the same reports out that you do, but it's um, a different API than XC test. So it's it makes it you know easier to read the test and understand, but it also, because it's a layer on top, is slower than using XC test. 
directly. So that's the the trade off there. I'm going to have to disagree with you a okay. little bit, Mike, in it. that I would say, yes, quick and nimble is, is fantastic as far as making things more descriptive and so forth. But to me, like it's more syntactical flavoring, if you will, than it is a strict requirement. Yes. SC test very much so used to be you had to have something in addition to it. You had to have some way to do like asynchronous testing. The very first version of XC test didn't really even provide a way to set up any sort of expectations. I'd say today, though, if you really want to, and a lot of my day-to-day stuff, I typically, unless there's a strong reason why, like you're saying, unless I need to do it in some sort of behavior or descriptive way that I want to actually set up up front, I don't necessarily opt for going to something else always just from the, the get-go. You can very much so use XE test right out of the box. And it is testing completes, well, as completes as you can get with Swift, you know, really having true mock support. But you can basically do everything with XE test that you can do with quick and nimble. It's just like you said, maybe it's a little bit more verbose, or maybe there's a little bit that you might do differently versus some of these BDD type frameworks that give you some nice syntaxes. I've uh, worked with like Mocha for like Node.js and some JavaScript stuff. I think that's behavioral driven, but it sounds to me like Quick and Nimble gives you that like syntactical sugar and a, a good way to like explain what each test actually does. Yeah. Whereas uh, XC test doesn't give you that, but it does give you the basic logic and API for doing just logical tests, which is more or less what TDD is really driving at. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that XC test doesn't give you the naming syntaxes or so forth, or, you know, like the nice thing about BDD and really the main difference, <laughs> you know, but on the other end of the things, I'm closer to the plain vanilla here than what it might sounds like. The nice thing about the BDD frameworks like Quick and Nimble is it will provide you the ability to say, okay, here's a, a descriptive string describing what I'm actually trying to test here. You can do the same thing using method signatures, and that's actually what we show in the book there is if you name your test correctly, you know, describing what you're doing, describing what is actually being tested and the expected outcome, you can get a lot of the same benefits from the just the vanilla XE test. But like Mike said, it's you know, more so by naming conventions that you set up, less so directly supported by XC test itself. So I want to jump a little bit more into TDD and talk about some of the terminology and some of the stuff that's involved. So we talked a little bit about like mocking. What exactly is mocking and what's it used for when it comes to test-driven development? If there's any other terms I'm forgetting that are components of test-driven development, let me know. Yeah. So. When you're writing tests, there's a a whole suite of objects that are falling into the category called test doubles, where basically you have an object that's just for testing that parallels a production code. I hate using the word production code, but um, the main app code object. So a mock is an object that behaves like the code. So for instance, you get like a mock network connection or like an NSURL session. And if you supply a command to that, like load data, your mock is responsible for handing back some set of fake data that you've supplied to the test. So it knows ahead of time what's going to happen and it's going to succeed or not. With mocks in particular, the idea is to verify that certain methods or behaviors happen along with that. So if you call, we go back to the mock data, URL data, you would verify that the data was returned correctly or if an error was made, like if you set it to make an error, that the error callback gets called and so on. You can also verify that certain methods are only called once or twice. So if you have a tertiary object further down, so like you want to save an object to a database, you want to make sure that you're not saving that same thing twice so there's no duplication in the code. You can verify that using a mock by adding methods to count the number of times a method is called and so on. I'm not sure if that was clear. Maybe Josh can help me out here. I agree with what you're saying there, Mike. The only sort of difference in my mind as far as uh, mocks versus What you mentioned, uh, another thing is a a test double there. A test double may not provide like verification type behavior. Like you verify that a sort of method was called. It may just accept those methods and just fill in as a dummy. You know, the simplest way to make just like a test double in my mind would be, you know, subclass something out or conform to a protocol and then implement nothing. And those are basically the two options that you have in Swift is you either implement a protocol to create a mock, and then you can, you know, just pass that to either be an initializer or, uh, you know, setting it as a property, or you can subclass something else. And again, you know, pass it in. But one way or another, you have to be able to insert yourself in this hierarchy of getting these calls. When creating a, a mock there, 
we're actually validating whatever happens, happens in, you know, maybe the correct order, or maybe it's that it happens in the correct count, whatever you're trying to actually accomplish at the time there, we're not just filling a, you know, just a dummy requirement. But with that said, sometimes, you know, we could create a mock and it may be that the initializer requires you have some sort of other object, but you don't really care, you're going to intercept calls in between, you might just create something that's just an empty object. And that's what I'd call like a test double or a dummy to me. So I guess in a way, my point is the mocks are a special type of test double that provides verification. So basically, like, for instance, I have a protocol or a mock of what a network call would be. Can I just like create a mock that pretends to do the call and then have like a Boolean property that says like is called and just set it to true? And then that way I can verify that that network call has been made. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, the, the simplest thing would be holding on to a Boolean and just saying that it's was actually called. But, you know, especially with networking, you're likely going to need to return something, right? So a lot of times we have... Right, exactly. So then you return some sort of like mock data based on that network call of some sort. Exactly. And with the mocks or the test doubles, you could actually have like with a real networking API, you got to go and hit a server. It's going to take however long to connect to that, get data, parse it, return it. That You've got the full stack there, right? Versus with the mock, you can immediately, you know, like asynchronously pass something back. Or if you want to turn it in, for, you know, take it from an asynchronous to a synchronous call, you can do that with a mock. So you eliminate having to talk to anything real by actually using a mock. It makes your tests much, much more faster and much more consistent as far as what you expect to happen. Given certain criteria, you can set up the criteria. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any libraries or frameworks that you'd recommend to help create those mocks? Or do you just pretty much implement whatever protocol? is going to pretend to do like networking or database or whatever it is? So for me, I guess the sort of nicety that Objective-C had, but Swift is actively moving away from this, is the ability to actually have mocks that are true mocks and that you say, all right, I want to mock this object. And it magically happens for you using like things like OC mock was a very popular framework that allowed you to do this in Objective-C. This isn't possible in Swift, because the Swift team actively wants to move things from the runtime to compile time. And for production code, that makes a lot of sense because anything that you can move to compile time, you can catch an error at compile time. You throw an error, it doesn't build. You know, the developer has to fix that. If something gets all the way through runtime, you likely have a runtime crash. So they're really trying to get rid of those runtime crashes. Unfortunately, that makes it basically impossible to do what OC Mock was doing with just pure Swift because there's nothing to you know put yourself in between as far as a runtime that you can actually intercept messages there. Instead, you basically only have two choices. You either conform to a protocol and implement all of the methods there, or you take whatever real object is and subclass that and just override whatever behavior, such as, you know, like we're talking about, maybe you just capture a Boolean instead of whatever the super class, the real object would have been doing. Now, with that said, you could definitely do those by hand. You'd have no choice as far as doing this at compile time. You have to compile something. So you can write it by hand, or there are a few niceties out there, like Sorcery, for example, is a nice tool that um, allows you yes. to write code. Instead of doing it by hand, you say, here's a template that I want to use. Anytime that I see this protocol, you know, that maybe conforms some auto-generating or something, Sorcery can write that for you. So one way or another, it has to be compile time, but there are tools out there to help with some of you know the harder bits of that or the annoying bits boilerplate bits i've just started playing around with sorcery sorcery is amazing what you could do with it yeah usually what i end up doing is just implementing that protocol and creating my own mock in the test library and that, that's essentially what i do because like you said you don't have that ability that dynamic runtime ability to just like create something on the fly like you can with the objective c so what are some other tips or tricks you have when it comes to like TDD besides mocking? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I think is a major component when it comes to TDD. But mocking is a big one. And if you have a healthy architecture, then I think you're good with mocking. I guess we'll jump into like what are some ways you can encourage TDD in your team? Like what are some ways that like somebody who is higher up, like a, a CTO or a manager, can make sure that we're getting the tests that we need and that code is actually being tested and run or written in a way that it is testable? There are two things, especially if you're talking to a CTO, that they like to hear is that maintainability 
and scalability and making sure that you have a complete working set of tests allows the team to be more efficient and add features faster in the future. So, you know, you know that you can add something without worrying that you're going to break existing behavior, especially as the app gets more complicated over time. You want to make sure that as people come and go in the organization or just as you forget, because you're doing a million different things, that there's some requirement that doesn't get lost because it was never really written down in a spec somewhere, but there's a test for it. Yeah, definitely maintainability is a win factor, if you will, as far as not having tests versus having tests. Also, prevention of regressions. You know, Mike is kind of getting that there too. If you don't have any tests, not only is it something that it may be that nobody on the team understands how it is because tests form documentation. It may be that later on you introduce bugs that you fixed in V1. Yeah, that's a sad thing to actually see. <laughs> the wins, though, are, are definitely those lines. As far as how to get your team to do it, though, I'd say first and foremost, especially if a, a team of any sort of, you know, more than just a couple developers, you should be promoting code reviews. And in the code reviews, if I, you know, see somebody on my team and they put out a code review that doesn't have any unit tests, I'm immediately rejecting it. And it has to have tests in order to even be considered to get into production. How do you know if it works without tests? So there is sort of a, you know, a philosophy of you must do testing, but you can obviously write unit tests without following TDD. I'd say as far as if you want to get your team to do TDD and, you know, bring up this test first mentality in this you know, get the benefits that TDD provides with, you know, you write tests first, you're going to get better coverage. And typically things will be designed in a more testable way versus trying to do that after the fact. I'd say the first and foremost, your team needs to know how to do it. If your team doesn't know test-driven development or, or know, you just have any experience in that area, it's hard to say, go and do test-driven development. With that said, you know, Mike and I, you know, part of the reason for writing this book was we looked at the community and said, you know, iOS community knows about unit testing, knows you know about these things to some extent, but we don't think there is a strong grasp for how TDD works. So that was a strong part of why we're actually putting this book together. So I'd say check out you know things like our book. Check out arraywinderlich.com for you know where you can go to get these materials to help get your team up to speed. But you know once they're up to speed, keep the bar high. Make sure that there's something in place like code reviews to make sure that it's actually happening. Yeah, when I've rolled it out on Teams. Usually what I do is I write a feature with the team there so that we can sort of like a, a pair programming or, you know, four person, five person programming to see the, the process and go through it. Because it can be a little strange if you're not used to doing it and a little slow in the, the first few days until you get the hang. But once you do, it's it's just like, you know, the second nature because it's just this iterative step. So having someone that can, can walk through and, and hold hands a little bit also makes it easy to make that transition. But it also has, you have to have a culture of testing that really wants this and is willing to allow developers the ability to, to take it on. I'd say as far as things that prevent a team from going to this, especially if the app's been around forever. If you've got an app and it's got you know several hundred or thousands or, or more of classes in it, just saying, all right, you've got to do this cycle where you build and compile every 30 seconds or, or you know faster than that. It may take several minutes to compile the full app, let alone run all the tests, right? You do have to do this in a way where one thing we are actually going to release a chapter on this in the book even is that you need to design not only the core app in a way that it can be testable, but there's nothing wrong with actually saying you can pull out modules. And so you've got a feature that's implemented just in a module and all of the code for what it's doing is within that module, any sort of externalities to it's using this third-party API or maybe even a different piece of your core application. You can put a protocol in between them. So breaking things up in a way that, okay, here's this small bit here, that's a module. Oh, a different piece that you accomplishes a different goal or something else, that's a different module. So you go from this huge monolithic app to, all right, a set of libraries, dynamic frameworks, whatever you're, you're opting to use based on your use cases, that can be compiled really quickly. You can run the tests against them really quickly. And you know, it can be changed pretty much independently, you know, without uh, affecting the rest of the code base. That's fantastic. That's, you know, code that isn't tightly coupled anymore. It's loosely coupled to the rest of the system. It's testable. It's something that can scale, you know, as much as you need it to. One of the things that was a game changer for me in doing this with a existing large app was just accepting that it was okay to do TDD for just the new code and any file that was there existing 
to not go through that level of rigor and accept the app as it is. And then in the book also, we describe how to like slowly add tests for the things that were there before. So you can mix and match TDD, even though it works best, you know, doing it, you know, straight up fresh, you can add it into your process slowly and not have to, to write, you know, 3000 tests before you can start writing a code because usually you're under some deadline to get something out there. Yeah, I think that's a big part of introducing anything new to a project. I'm thinking about it this week with Swift UI. Like when they introduce Swift, you shouldn't go in and rewrite your whole project to be in Swift. If it's an Objective C, you shouldn't, you know, rip out every storyboard and convert everything to Swift UI for a thousand reasons. And I think just with TDD, like you shouldn't just go in and start writing tests for all of your existing code. Like I think it's just easier to slowly introduce it as you write new features. And naturally, over time, it'll develop that. Like most of your code will end up being test driven in the end. De- definitely. You don't need to just jump into here and uh, go right to the deep end. You can start by just adding it, like Mike said, for new code only, or identify hey, here's this core part of the app. We really need to make sure that this works, or we need to make some changes around this. How can we make sure we're not going to break in the process? There's nothing that says you can't put in test place there as you need them and identify them. You don't have to go back and just add, I'd actually be against this. If my team come and said, we want to introduce TDD, I'm going to add tests throughout the app before I can ship any new features. No, that's not a good thing to do. It's, it's probably going to be something that you're going to waste time with that. So adding them slowly over time, especially for the very big apps, may actually be not only the best choice, but maybe the only choice if you actually want to you know, continue moving forward with delivering and you know, creating new features at the same time. So what are some other mistakes you think, either with teams that are getting started with test-driven development or just teams that are doing thinking that they're doing test-driven development and actually they're not? What are some common mistakes that teams and developers make when they're doing TDD? So I think you know one of the mistakes is only covering the happy path or golden path through the code. So you want to make sure that you're testing the edge cases and different combinations of parameters. And if you find that your function, you know, has, you know, 4,200, you know, different uh, combinations of input, you know, that's kind of a code smell there. It may be an indication to break things up into the smaller pieces. How do you create enough test data so that you know you're testing as many cases as possible? Like, let's say you have a function that takes in addition, like, does addition, does that mean that I need to test every addition problem possible? What would be a great way to, like, break that down? With math, you've got your basic you know, making sure that you have, you know, cover zeros, you know, negative values, values at the max, you know, max float, max int, those type of things when you're doing it. Those are you know, probably more academic. I think most apps are in the, you know, putting JSON into a table sort. So for there, you know, your bounds are more, you know, did you get back an empty array? You know, do you have text, you know, for a field that's six megabytes when you're expecting just a sentence, you know, that type of things. There's probably a good thing on GitHub somewhere that's like common things to look out for for that. If you have code like an if statement or a branch or you know a, a do catch, those are pretty good indicators that you should have a test that at least covers that. So you can use uh, test coverage as a way of at least making sure that you've um, executing the code. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Is like you're basically talking about test coverage, which if I understand correctly, is like basically making sure that every line of code. And Xcode does actually, I don't know about you guys, but it seems to do a decent job as far as the test coverage instrumentation. But like, it'll actually tell you if you've covered every if branch or switch case in every line of code. And it gives you a percentage that seems pretty reasonable. Yeah, I and mean, that's a good start. I won't cover the out of bounds issues or overflows or underflows, the errors with formatting and things like that, because you know, you're still running that code. So you're cognizant of, of what the function is trying to do as well. But yeah, test coverage is a good way to start. The tricky thing we've run into with test coverage, though, is we have multiple test targets. And Xcode, I haven't found a good way to sort of sum up the coverage across a multiple test targets. And maybe the new test plans handles that. What do you mean by test targets, just briefly? So just like you can have multiple targets, so you can build frameworks within a project, multiple apps, you can build multiple test targets. So you can group your tests based upon, you can have tests that just cover networking or databases or tests that cover each framework in a test suite. And in your scheme, you can specify that when you run the the test action, which test targets get run. 
And so we've broken up our app into many different libraries and each library has its own test target. So we can either run all the suites or if we're just modifying code in one of the frameworks, we just run the, the tests when you're doing local development. That's a good reason to, you know, as far as why coverage isn't the end all be all story. So it may not be, you know, especially in Mike's case there, because he has the multiple targets, it isn't actually a true story in that they could be that you've got two targets and they've each got 50%, 50%. Do you have 100% coverage? Is there any overlap between <laughs> the two of them? It's difficult to say, right? So I'd say another sort of common error, especially as far as management goes, is over you know, giving too much emphasis to test coverage. Test coverage should be something you look at. You know, if you have 0% versus 80%, obviously I'm going to say, oh, 80% is probably covering more than, you know, the closer you get to the zero. But it's not the most important metric. If you said, oh, as a manager, I'm going to say 100% of, you know, the code must be covered by tests. I don't think that's a good goal. You know, it doesn't tell you actually, you know, very much for what that is. All it indicates is a particular line of code was executed. You know, was it executed with the right inputs? Was it executed with all the edge cases like Mike is talking about? I don't know. So my point is, use it as a starting point, but that's not the only thing you should consider. You got to look at, you know, are the cases that are the edge cases, are the normal flows, are all, you know, all of the entire picture is what you should actually be considering. The nice thing about doing TDD, by the way, instead of instead of writing these after the fact and adding the unit tests on after you've got all the if else's or switches or whatever your code is, TDD says in order to add new functionality, I have to write a test first. So TDD, for the most part, is going to be more likely to get you in a case where you've covered all of these edge cases. Now, in certain times, especially with things like the out of bounds, you might miss something, right? And you might miss, you know, here's this one weird edge case we didn't think about. And you know, we accidentally wrote code that either performs correctly, that's a win, or, you know, misses this thing without actually having the test in place. That's okay. Even after you do TDD or, you know, you have tests, if you identify you're missing a test, add a test. Nothing that says you can always go back and, you know, add more where you need. But, you know, knowing up front you got most of everything, that's what TDD, you know, provides you a stronger guarantee of than just adding tests willy-nilly. One question I have when I am writing, starting to write like an app is sometimes I need to like explore a particular API and just to make sure I have the functionality of that API down before I've even gotten to a point to understand what, what to test. So for instance, you're talking like core motion or something like HealthKit. I need to understand how HealthKit expects me to get the data back. So I end up actually writing the code before I've even written the test. How do you explore TDD when you're like working with a brand new API that you've never even worked with? For me, there's nothing wrong with doing a spike solution. So I've never used an API before. How good is my code actually going to be the first go around that, you know, I'm actually touching or using this thing? Maybe it's okay, but probably not great, right? I can go and explore this in a test app and compiling just a few classes is going to be way quicker than compiling my entire code base and just play with it. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm after I'm, I'm done, I can look back and say, well, this isn't actually too bad. And then I might actually rewrite whatever I did in a TDD fashion and, you know, improve it from there. Or I might say, oh, this code is, I mean, at least I learned what I was you know, trying to learn, but this is actually pretty off or it's not going to work in my case. I can you know, entirely throw away a spike that takes me just an hour or a couple hours to do and go back and, you know, implement it in a correct TDD fashion. That's, you know, one way. The other way is if you do have some notion of what it does and how it's supposed to work, you can write tests in advance that has the, you know, just the behavior of how the thing works that you're, you're trying to interact with. Things like core motion might be harder because it's actually, you know, doing asynchronous things or requiring you move around in the real world. For those sorts of bits there, uh, you know, it may be that you can't do a lot of the testing up front, but uh, other sorts of APIs, like maybe making RESTful calls, you can wait on a RESTful call and, you know, accept that I'm just going to write these tests as a temporary thing to see what it returns. There's nothing wrong with doing that and, you know, just using it as experimentation. So for me, if I'm touching a new thing, those are my go-to. Either use a spike solution that I may or may not keep, and if I do keep, I'm going to have to write tests for it in a TDD fashion, or just write tests that are temporary tests that are for exploratory only and throw them away after I'm done because they're not actually useful. 
or that might be useful for learning, but they're not useful for keeping in my project forever. So almost like a rewrite, like you basically explore the solution, write the app that kind of does the behavior more or less, and then go through and then rewrite it with a little bit more architecture and tests within it. Is that what I'm hearing? You've never used it before, right? So if you've never used an API, you're not going to know how it works or what's best to do with it, what's not to do. Your first solution probably isn't going to be great. So a lot of times it's worthwhile to throw out whatever you're doing because it's more of a learning thing than it is anything that's going to truly be worthwhile to put in production. 100% for me. One of the things that we have in our workspace is we have a couple of playgrounds where we actually import the local frameworks from our project. So if we wanted to like test how something new interacts with the code we've already built, we have that ready to go. And so you can spend some time in the playground, adding a code, calling a new API, seeing how that goes. Obviously, once again, that doesn't really work for hardware dependent things, but for your learning core location or, you know, uh, something with a SQL, something like that, those definitely work there. Awesome. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about when it comes to test-driven development? And before I ask more about WWDC. I think that it's becoming more and more industry standard, especially, and I'm sure it's been in the server-side world for a long time, but in terms of the app world, I know I've had conversations with my executives and they start talking about it in a meeting and, and it usually takes a couple of uh, years before they learn about whatever the cool new thing is. I think going forward, we're going to be living in a world where this is more natural and each year Xcode gets a little bit better in terms of supporting the tests, especially in terms of, of test running and test performance. One thing we didn't really touch on is having some kind of continuous integration going, which I think is it's not essential because TDD is just a methodology. But in practice, if you have a server that's always running these tests, it makes it easier to catch things and make sure that you know there aren't issues with, with merges or when you have multiple developers working on something, not everyone may run all the tests before they, they submit. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about continuous integration. What have you done as far as that's concerned, like I've done like open source projects on GitHub and I pretty much run Travis CI for doing my, you know, simple, essentially running my tests and testing it on different operating systems and different devices. What are some ways that you've done continuous integration? How have you seen benefits from that? We use uh, Jenkins. So we have a local server that actually we have, I don't know how many Mac mini nodes um, that run our tests and we use it's a product called Fastlane, which I think is, is pretty common in the iOS world. That's kind of like the, it sits on top of Xcode build and allows you to basically specify the configuration for building and testing. And you can run multiple tests and upload to iTunes Connect and, and things like that as part of the service. But you know, the important thing there is we have probably about 50 engineers that contribute to our code base. And so it's essential to make sure that what we have is always in good working order. But if you're working on a small team or you're working by yourself, your Travis or Circle CI are good solutions. Xcode Server is what Apple keeps pushing. I haven't seen anyone use that in practice, but it has all the integrations with Xcode. So if you're able to use it and you're just building an iOS or Mac OS app, you know, I think it's going to work out pretty well, well for you because it, it knows all about Xcode tests and code coverage and, and things like that. Yeah, I've worked with uh, Xcode Server. I've actually set up a virtual machine to run whatever the few, like I'll probably set up one in a week or so and using Catalina and then put Xcode Server on it. And it's pretty decent. Like there's a lot to it, some tweaking and things that you have to consider when you set up your project. But yeah, it works pretty decent. Yeah, so I basically used all of them myself. And I'd say given the choice between using nothing or picking at random even, right? The picking at random is, going to be better than using nothing at all, especially, you know, the more engineers you have, the bigger bang you actually get for wanting to use continuous integration. And sure, at some point, it's just strictly required, frankly. You know, like my team is pretty large. But if you have maybe one, two developers, especially if you're following TDD, I don't know there's strictly required for, for that size per se, because you do want to be constantly just running all of the tests, right? But once you reach a certain point where you have to ensure, okay, the project is just so large or you've got so many engineers that you really need to have some safeguards and checks in place other than just, you know, cowboy, everybody agrees this is the right way to do it. Continuous integration definitely is a requirement, you know, and Xcode server is a good one, you know, especially if you have a Mac mini or something around or I haven't done it with a virtual machine, although now I want to try. <laughs> so that's a good suggestion. <laughs> 
But it's it's an easy thing. Yeah, to especially if you're doing anything, if you're going to be trying any new stuff, you probably want to put Catalina on a VM instead of running it on a on your main machine that's living on the edge. If you want to do that, I mean, the Mac Minis are still pretty cheap. So our our group uses just a small fleet of Mac Minis as as well there. But the cheaper route is going to the VM, I'm sure. So I guess maybe Parallel or something, depending on how you're running it. I suppose maybe you have to buy the parallelization software. I don't I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, great, guys. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, before we close out, you want to talk a little bit about your book again? It's uh, iOS uh, Test Driven Development by Tutorials, available now uh, at windowlook.com. We have an early access that has the first third of the book, and the whole book should be out in the fall. It covers the whole TDD from starting from nothing. We have a whole big piece on uh, networking because there's Almost every app has that, and it's tricky to test. We have chapters on how to work with a big legacy app, especially where legacy means no tests or insufficient testing. It goes through each of these things step by step, so you follow along. So unlike other books that may give a more theoretical approach or merge to say, here's what your code should look like, this is very step by step. You follow along, going through adding the tests, adding the test targets, the whole shebang. I'd say we've done the hard work for you going through the Apple APIs and, you know, having very experienced developers that, you know, Mike and I, I've used this for several years. Mike has used this for several years here. You don't want to learn all this stuff by yourself. It'll take longer. It'll be harder to do. If you want to get up to speed and get running quickly, it's the best way. Just get the book, save yourself some time, save yourself some sanity, having to not go through those Apple APIs yourself and get running quickly. You know, get up to speed quickly. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm really looking forward to taking a look at this book and uh, just learning some new ways to do TDD when it comes to Xcode and iOS. Before we close out, do you guys have any thoughts on some of the new stuff from WWDC and how it pertains to uh, test-driven development? Unfortunately, it's about six hours from the uh, what's new in testing in Xcode. So... <laughs> What I've seen so far has just been what they've covered in the what's new in Xcode and the State of the Union. But it looks like that there's some new methods for, you know, we've had the measuring blocks before that measure the time your test takes. And now it looks like you can also measure memory usage, disk usage, and a bunch of, of other things, which is really great. They're not really so like for, for test-driven development, but when you're building reliability tests and performance tests, I think that those are going to be pretty handy. And then there's this new thing called test plans, which basically takes all the management of tests from the scheme into a separate top-level object in your project, and you can rerun your tests against multiple configurations. So you can run all your tests in English and then run all the tests again in French or whatever in one click. They also have for different test ordering and different runtime checks and, and all that. So it's it takes one manual step out of the loop, but it, I wouldn't necessarily think it's super revolutionary. Uh, what do you think, Josh? I'm totally with you. As far as the new features, they look pretty cool for Xcode goes. I also wanted to point out that with the Swift UI, they've really gone very much so protocol-oriented development. That's great news for things like testing and you know test-driven development here. Anytime you can put in a protocol in place, you can insert a mock very easily into whatever setup it is. So I'm very excited to see how they've really architected Swift UI, and it looks like just testing is going to be a lot easier compared to you know, some of the previous solutions where you've got a concrete class and just figuring out how you're going to mock that out you know, via subclass or whatnot may have been very difficult with pure UI kit. It looks like Swift UI is going to help us quite a bit in the testing realm. So I'm very excited to dive into it and learn everything about you know, all the cool stuff that they've done and cool stuff to make uh, developers' lives easier with testing. You're talking about the difference between like UI view controller, which is this class you have to subclass, as opposed to like the Swift UI view protocol, which you could pretty much mock up any way you want to, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The whole UI view controller thing, there's so much concrete stuff in that. It's difficult to truly create great mocks with it. I mean, you can you know, create a mock by subclassing UI view controller, right? But had that been a protocol, I mean, you can combine protocols so much more easily, combine functionality using protocol-oriented development, but creating mocks, the same thing. You can just conform to that mock and just uh, implement whatever methods you actually care about. And it's just a much more elegant solution, a much more, you know, architecture friendly solution going with the 
protocol than something concrete. So it's a very good job on Apple's part and, you know, is my take on it. So I haven't gone to see all of the default implementations and stuff they give you, but, you know, hopefully it's sane. And, you know, from what I have seen, it looks very well done. One of the nice things with SwiftUI is they're really, is from their sample code, encouraging people to build out separate model classes, which also makes it easier to test because... Yeah, you're talking like the previews and stuff? Yeah, well, the previews, and you can have, being able to put multiple previews in the assistant, I think will make it great for testing, not really testing, but just visualizing the different conditions before you even get to the point of completing your code. But the at state, you can have a separate model class be bound to your view you to put that logic of loading data and changing data and so on outside of the view. A lot of people couple in their view controllers the setting of the view state and then the model state. So it's exciting. It looks like they're kind of pushing like component-based development too. Yeah. You know, I've seen like so many developers where you need a custom UI tab controller or something, right? So you go and instead of writing something your own, which may have been the right solution, you go and you try to reuse apples and then you're trying to hack internal methods and so forth, and it's just hard to do. With the whole Swift UI thing, they provided a same base and said, look, you need new components, you can create some. I'm excited from testing because the idea being you could split those off into their own library, here's this component that I need, or set of components that I need, and just pull them in as you need and ensure that they're tested really well. So again, it just looks really well done. So the team did a really good job as far as everything I've seen so far. Well, thank you so much, guys, for coming on the program. If folks want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Sure. So if you have questions about the book, we actually have a forum on raywinderlick.com. We actively monitor that as authors of the book. So if you have questions, ask them there, and we will actually answer you for anything that you've got. If you want to reach us personally, grg.developer at gmail.com is my email, or Twitter, grg underscore developer. And I'm uh, the Mike Katz on Twitter. Well, thank you so much, Vice, for coming on. And maybe we'll talk again later about SwiftUI and how that's going to improve test-driven development.